I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about Abraham Lincoln tonight, as the sign uh, promises on the screen behind me. Uh, and I'm going to try to tie that into the theme of the conference, which is, of course, sacrifice. Um, that's an appropriate theme, I think, as we observe the 150th anniversary, the sesquicentennial of the American Civil War. As it wraps up here in early 2015, we think about the events of early 1865. The sacrifice of the soldiers, of course, is all too evident. Hardly needs repeating. Not only in the 700 or 750 or perhaps even 800,000 deaths associated with that conflict, the numbers have increased by probably six figures based on research done in just the last 12 months about the number killed. Uh, that was about 2.5% of the entire population of the country. And to keep that in perspective, we have to recall that a similar percentage of today's population would mean 8 million dead. Uh, and the impact of that, not only on obviously those who died, but those loved ones they left behind and the entire society of which they were a part can hardly be overestimated. And there were the sacrifices too by those who did not die in the American Civil War, but may have wished that they had. Those who came home absent an arm or a leg or both, or who had horrible wounds that disfigured them in one way or another, some so much so that they could no longer be recognized by their mothers. And those uncounted, and at that time largely unacknowledged, thousands or tens of thousands, but most probably hundreds of thousands, who came home from the war physically intact, but shattered emotionally by the experience. Now we recognize what that is, but in the middle of the 19th century, no one would speak of it. And there were the non-combatants who lost a loved one, or two, or three, in that war, those who lost their possessions, their homes, their livelihoods, the children who lost their youth in that war, all that sacrifice. And yet this war, the American Civil War, and the one fought between 1941 and 1945, were the most essential of all American wars. Because by 1863, 1860 history had painted the United States into a corner. And there was no way out, save through sacrifice. As Lincoln noted in his second inaugural, no one wanted the war. But no one could prevent it. And the war came. Slavery was, after all, the great Gordian knot of American history, and it had grown so entangled over 250 years that untying it was simply beyond human capability. It took a terrible war to cut it, as Alexander the Great slashed the original Gordian knot with a sword. The sacrifice, then, was also part of the redemption. Sacrifice and redemption were themes in many, indeed almost in most, of the speeches of Abraham Lincoln, including famously his second inaugural, the 150th anniversary of which we will observe next week, this coming Wednesday, in fact. It was a moment for reflection for the 16th president as he assessed the terrible costs of war, now apparently so close to ending. And he tried to gather up the threads of that experience, of that sacrifice, of a once common people, noting that both read the same Bible, both pray to the same God. Each invokes his help against the other. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. And what were those purposes? Was that horrible cost, the sacrifice of a generation, worth it? Uh, 
Lincoln suggested it might well be beyond the ability of mere mortals to know. Back to the second inaugural. If God wills that the war continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid for by another drawn with the sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The sacrifice had indeed been horrible, and it remained to be seen if the result justified the cost. And thinking of that weighed heavily on Abraham Lincoln. He, of course, had been a principal instrument of that sacrifice. He might have said in the winter of 1861, go my erring brothers. But he didn't do that. He insisted on union to prove that the experiment in national democratic society was valid to show the world that it would work. And that meant war. And as the war progressed and the opportunity grew, he insisted too that it become a war of liberation for the enslaved, which ensured that it would be a war to the death. And that weighed on him too. But he saw that there would still have been sacrifice, different sacrifices, sacrifices by others, surely, but sacrifice nonetheless, had he chosen a different course what he saw as a more craven course. Then, too, Abraham Lincoln managed the war that brought that sacrifice, and that, too, weighed on him. It was a role that he did not seek, that he did not want. Indeed, in his selection of generals and admirals, too, he sought men who would be willing to carry that load for him. He discovered that many who claimed that they could, in fact, could not or would not. And so increasingly, it was Lincoln's hand at the tiller as the nation fought its greatest and bloodiest war. In the United States Constitution, the power and the responsibility to act as commander in chief of the Army and Navy of the United States is the first of the enumerated powers that is granted to the President in Article 2, Section 2. The Constitution, however, is entirely silent about what that means. What exactly are the powers of the Commander-in-Chief? We're still figuring that out today in Washington, D.C. The Constitution does not say, and the country has debated it ever since. The reason the framers ignored this crucial constitutional issue is, I suspect, and in fact I'm convinced, is because the drafters of that document fully expected that the man who would occupy the position of President of the United States was George Washington. And it would be pretty presumptuous of them to try to define for George Washington what it meant to be a general or a commander in chief. As it happened, Washington himself took that charge quite literally during the Whiskey Rebellion, for example, in 1791, donning a uniform and riding out at the head of his troops into Pennsylvania. That may be exactly what the framers had in mind. Another president, Andrew Jackson, at least considered doing very much the same thing during the nullification crisis of 1832-33. Of course, both of these men had been generals before they became president. And for them, thinking in terms of hands-on command was almost second nature. The two other wartime presidents prior to Lincoln who dealt with the wartime situation acted quite differently. 
Neither James Madison during the War of 1812 or James K. Polk during the Mexican War ever considered taking the field personally, though Madison did ride out to the battlefield at Bladensburg in a carriage in 1814 to watch the action and was almost taken prisoner by the British when they absolutely steamrollered the American militia when they broke and ran. Lincoln's conception of the proper role of commander-in-chief was closer to that of Madison and Polk than it was to Jefferson and Jackson. Indeed, the very notion of appearing in public in a uniform probably brought a wry smile to Lincoln's craggy face since he knew he did not cut a very convincing figure as a military man. He was a competent horseman, but his angular frame often looked awkward on horseback when he visited the soldiers in their camps. His trouser legs often rode up over the top of his socks, exposing white presidential shins as he rode along. And some of the generals thought this was undignified, but of course the soldiers loved him for it. Lincoln simply rejected the whole idea of a president as a dashing military commander. As most of you probably know, he mocked his very brief experience as a militia captain during the Black Hawk War in the 1830s, uh, joking with his congressional colleagues in 1847 during the Mexican War when he was in effect a war protester, that he was a military hero. Did you know, he said, that I am a military hero? I fought many bloody battles with the mosquitoes. The Napoleonic example held no allure for Abraham Lincoln. And yet almost from the beginning, Lincoln had a very clear conception of how the war to save the Union needed to be fought. The North, he wrote in a letter to one of his generals early in his term, the North had the advantage in numbers. The advantage in industrial capability, the advantage in equipment and materiel. The South had the advantage of interior lines. The way to make the North's advantage overwhelm that of the South was to attack several places at the same time. That way the South would have to choose what to defend, and what it chose not to defend could be reoccupied by advancing Union armies. It was essentially the grand strategy that Ulysses S. Grant would adopt in 1864, but it was not until 1864 that Lincoln could convince his generals that it could be done. Another problem for Lincoln was the fact that there was no constitutional guidance, no precedent of any kind or even any statute that defined the ways in which the army and the navy could cooperate. Remember that in 1861, there was no such thing as a Department of Defense, a Joint Chiefs of Staff, no existing protocol by which the services could work together. There was a Secretary of the Army that represented, obviously, the Army, and a Secretary of the Navy that represented the Navy, and they despised each other. In all of America's previous wars, the Army and the Navy had acted independently more like reluctant allies than branches of the same government. When previous, in previous wars, cooperation had been necessary, such as, for example, in the amphibious expedition to Veracruz in the Mexican War, the commanders of the Army and the Navy would get together and they would kind of talk about what will we do and so forth, but neither could give orders to the other. I remember telling my students when I was still teaching the Civil War course at the Academy that during the Civil War, the highest ranking general in the Army, the three-star Lieutenant General Winfield Scott, could not give an order to the lowest ranking seaman recruit in the Navy. And of course, my students said, well, sir, that's exactly the way it ought to be. <laughs> the commanders had to meet together to work it out between themselves. And if they could not work it out, well, then nothing happened. During the Civil War, that was especially problematic in the Western Theater, where the river gunboats and the land armies needed, needed to cooperate if these things were going to work, but where neither Army General nor Navy Flag Officer, the 
early rank of flag officer, later morphing into the rank of rear admiral. Neither of them had any statutory command authority over the other. At Forts Henry and Donaldson, Ulysses S. Grant and Andrew Hull Foote worked together because they chose to do so. In effect, the Union forces in the West pretty much muddled through, achieving success in part because of their superiority in numbers, both on land and on the rivers, and of course the appallingly bad command performance by Southern leaders, in particular John Floyd and Gideon Pillow, arguably two of the worst generals in American history. Nevertheless, what these episodes demonstrated to Lincoln was that he would have to become more of an activist commander in chief. He would actually have to fulfill the kind of role that Washington and Jackson had done when they had been president. In addition, Lincoln also had to insert himself into the naval war because of the cupidity of some of his naval commanders who committed acts that forced him to undertake diplomatic damage control, for lack of a better term, in regard to the nation's foreign policy. Maybe the most obvious of these is when Captain Charles Wilkes stopped a British packet steamer, HMS Trent, and took John Murray Mason and John Slidell James Murray Mason and John Slidell off of the Trent and brought them back to New York City as prisoners, thus violating British neutrality. Well, it provoked a quite hostile response on the part of the British. It might have led to war. And as a result, despite Lincoln's instinct to stay out of the details of managing the affairs of his military services, he became an activist commander in chief because he had to do it. In much the same way, the actions of the Navy compelled Lincoln to deal sooner than he would have liked with what became certainly the central issue of that war, and historically the single most important aspect of the American Civil War. That is the question of slavery itself. As we know, Lincoln ran for president in the first place, not merely because of that little engine of ambition that his law partner Billy Herndon talked about in his memoir, but because Lincoln believed that by preventing the extension of slavery into the Western territories, essentially halting its spread, he could put the institution on the track to eventual extinction. He did not believe he had the authority as president, nor did any president, to interfere with the existence of slavery in those states where it was legally established, but he could prevent its extension into the national territories, and that at least might create the preconditions for its eventual demise. Now that he was president and fighting a war to save the Union, he saw that the momentum of events was likely to enable him to strike more directly at the institution and to do so much sooner than he had thought possible. But to do that, he first had to ensure that the Union survived, because without that, nothing else could be done. What Lincoln wanted was to let the issue of slavery and its future go unremarked as long as possible until he secured national unity. He knew that any move by him to abolish slavery, where it already existed, was not only constitutionally problematical, but it would undermine and very likely destroy the fragile political coalition that held him and his brand new political party in power. It was, after all, a coalition of Republicans, war Democrats, former Whigs, know-nothings, Liberty Party members. The great irony of Lincoln's presidency was this. In order for him to mount a long-term and meaningful assault on slavery, it was essential to save the Union. And he could not save the Union if he attacked slavery too openly or too soon. The need to sustain this delicate balancing act led Lincoln to postpone dealing with slavery, even defining a policy on slavery for as long as possible until public opinion caught up with him. Alas for those hopes, eager ideologues often forced him to confront it prematurely. John C. Fremont, in the West, David Hunter along the coast, 
Simon Cameron in his position as Secretary of War, who approved on his own authority the arming of black soldiers as early as 1861, long before Lincoln or the country was ready for it. I'm going to talk about the blockade of the coast, uh, the Confederate coast, tomorrow morning. Uh, but for now, let me merely mention that naval officers who served on blockade duty were among the first to encounter the results of this new social dynamic that emerged between master and slave once the war began. Indeed, far from the fighting front, if you weren't in Virginia or Tennessee where the battles were taking place, if you were back in northern Alabama or central Louisiana, there was very little difference in the nature of master-slave relations after the war began. But along the coast, where the slaves could see Union warships on the horizon, it was different. In many cases, the white masters of plantations on the coastal islands, just north and south of where we are here, had fled to the mainland, leaving their property, including their human property, behind. In many cases, they then requested that rebel cavalry forces go back to those sea islands to drive, that was the word they used, to drive their property from their cabins and onto the mainland, where at least they could be rented out as day laborers. Instead, the slaves saw in these circumstances uh, an opportunity, especially with those Yankee gunboats right off the coast. In the early spring of 1862, Captain John B. Marchand of the USS James Adger was steaming up the Stono River just south of Charleston, South Carolina during a reconnaissance when he encountered some of those daring escapees. And according to his diary, they came down to the bank as he drew near, and the women in particular held out their arms, sometimes holding up their children in an obvious appeal for aid. He felt he could not just steam on and leave them there, so he took them on board. But he couldn't keep them there. What was he going to do with them? And soon such scenarios were reenacted all along the coast as first hundreds and then thousands and finally tens of thousands of so-called contrabands came down to the coastline or along the rivers, flagged down Union ships and begged to be taken on board. It was both a human tragedy and for Lincoln, a political crisis. He didn't need this right now. The short-term practical solution to this human tragedy was to establish colonies for the formerly enslaved along the coast. The commander of the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron, Samuel F. DuPont, established one of those colonies, the first one in fact, on Edisto Island near Port Royal, and between 700 and 900 displaced blacks settled there in the first week. But then others arrived, lots of others. Within a week, there were 1,400. And soon, there were dozens of such camps and thousands of such persons. And the strains of sustaining them was threatening to overwhelm the Navy's logistical capabilities. Charles Francis Adams, Jr., who was serving as an officer with the Union Army on Hilton Head Island, wrote his father, who happened, by the way, to be the ambassador to Great Britain, we now have some 7,000 masterless slaves within our line, and in less than two months, we shall have more than 70,000. And what are we to do with them? What indeed? Here was a question that went well beyond human tragedy into the realm of politics. It could only be answered by the beleaguered commander-in-chief, who had hoped not to have to address this question at all, not yet. When DuPont wrote to Wells and asked him plainly, what am I supposed to do with these dependent refugees? Wells replied by saying that as many able-bodied men as possible could be taken into the Navy. There's no direct evidence that Wells checked with Lincoln first before offering this advice, but it's unlikely he would have made the decision on his own. Lincoln, remember, had already told Fremont and Hunter when they tried to emancipate slaves within their own theaters that that was unacceptable, and he had fired Sam and Cameron, 
from his position as Secretary of War for attempting to arm black regiments. It's not that Lincoln opposed these moves in any way, but he understood more clearly than they did that striking prematurely at the institution of slavery would upset the political balance that sustained his administration. Too much so-called progress now would be no progress in the long run. In this case, Lincoln interestingly remained silent when Wells began recruiting escaped slaves into the Navy in large numbers. Very likely he appreciated that the idea of blacks serving aboard United States Navy warships off the South Atlantic coast was less socially threatening to northern voters than the image of blacks on land with rifles in their hands. It helped that black sailors had always been part of the United States Navy, making up about 15% of the total from the time of John Paul Jones onward. Of course, those blacks had been free men not escaped slaves. And that made Wells' decision and Lincoln's silence about that decision a bit of a revolution. Not all of the refugees could be brought into the Navy, of course. They weren't all men of military age. The women and the children, the old men, they had to be settled in the camps, as was already being done. But then they had to be fed, and they had to be defended. Salmon P. Chase, Lincoln's emancipationist-minded Secretary of the Treasury and the principal one of rivals for Lincoln's job, urged the president to establish a formal program to organize them, supply them, even arm them for their own self-defense. Once again, Lincoln was not against these proposals, but he saw that it was well in advance of what most of the public would accept. He would not sanction such a step without paying a huge political price. When Chase sent an agent to see Lincoln to convince him to do something about this, Lincoln initially put him off. No, no, no. Not the right time. Not now. And the man turned to leave. And just as he was at the door, Lincoln stopped him and called him back. And he scribbled out a note, signing it, A. Lincoln, a note for Chase, handed it to the man, and asked him to deliver it. It was a note giving instructions in regard to establishing contraband camps all along the South Atlantic coast, leaving it entirely in Chase's hands. Well, Lincoln surely knew that given Chase's views toward emancipation, he was in effect giving Chase carte blanche, a blank check, if you would, to establish a program leading to the objectives of future black citizenship. One of Lincoln's favorite stories, and you all know that Lincoln loved to tell stories. They always had a point, and this one did too. And one of his favorite stories, which he told several times, concerned the Irish priest. Irish priest who came to visit and when offered a swig of whiskey, declared, no, 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 my piety you see, will not allow me to imbibe spirits. But if somehow a wee dram came to be added to his coffee, unbeknownst to him, he would not object to that. When Lincoln allowed the sympathetic chase to establish a program for runaway slaves along the South Atlantic coast, he was surely aware that Chase would encourage an expanded program of support for refugees, including, as it did, the introduction of schools, the distribution of land, the distribution of arms. Lincoln did not initiate those programs, but he did not object if they occurred unbeknownst to him. Another way the Navy's activities compelled Lincoln to become more involved than he might otherwise have preferred to be was in the burgeoning technology of the naval war. Civil war, of course, one of the things that makes it so interesting, I suspect, to most of us, that it sits on kind of a technological pivot point between the age of, I don't know, Sir Walter Raleigh and, and, and the First World War. Um, it was the first war that involved the widespread use of the railroad, the telegraph, breech-loading rifles, steel cannons, torpedoes, and armored warships. 
And all of them became efficient dispensers of death and pain and sacrifice. And while Lincoln accepted and approved all of them, he did so in order to end the war as swiftly as he possibly could. He was particularly supportive of that new class of iron-armored warships known as monitors, which might not have been adopted at all, but for his intervention and support. By 1865, in fact, 150 years ago now, the monitors had become the workhorse warships of the Union Navy, particularly the Passaic class monitors that contained two enormous 15-inch guns in their rotating turrets. Several of them took part in the bombardment of Fort Fisher, not far from where we sit, in the winter of 1864-65. And afterwards, several of them returned to the Washington Navy Yard for a refit. And it was there in April of 1865 that Lincoln spotted one of them, the USS Montauk, tied up at the pier. He used to go regularly down to the Washington Navy Yard to I suspect, to get away from the White House, uh, but also to see what new military inventions were available. And he stopped his carriage to look at it. Intrigued by gadgets all his life, he asked the crew if he could come aboard. Well, what do you tell the president when he asks if he can come aboard? Well, Mr. President, please, please do. It's about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. His wife, Mary, was with him, and she went aboard, too. Uh, and the presidential party was received with appropriate uh, ceremonies, and the officers offered Lincoln a tour of the ship, which he found absolutely fascinating. And when it was over, Lincoln thanked them, offering a short, sadly unrecorded speech of congratulations for their recent success at Fort Fisher. And then almost as an afterthought, he told them that he and his wife were going to the theater that night. And he invited as many of the officers and crew as could be spared to come be his guests at the staging of Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater. And he left. What little we know about this ship visit comes from a letter in the Lincoln Papers at the Chicago History Museum written by the surgeon on board the USS Montauk, George B. Todd, which he wrote to his brother, Henry P. Todd, who lived in Spencerport, New York. It was dated April 15th, 1865. And in it, the surgeon told his brother what he saw and what he remembered of that fateful April 14th. It has never been published. I've never seen it, at least in print. It's been quoted occasionally, selectively by others, but I'd like to share a section of it with you. Here's what George Todd wrote to his brother. Dear bro, yeah. Really, honest to God, dear bro, the few hours that have intervened since that most terrible tragedy of last night have served to give me a clearer brain, and I believe I am now able to give you a clear account up to this hour. Yesterday, about 3 o'clock, the president and his wife drove down to the Navy Yard and paid our ship a visit, going all over her, accompanied by us all. Both seemed very happy and so expressed themselves glad that this war was over, or so near its end, and then drove back to the White House. In the evening, nearly all of us, and by that I suspect he means the officers, went to Ford's Theater. I was very early and got a seat very near the president's private box. As we heard, he was to be there, and at about half past seven, he came in with his wife and was cheered by everyone. As soon as there was a silence, the play went on, and I could see that the president seemed to enjoy it very much. About, and then he writes the time in there, but it's indecipherable in the letter. It's handwritten, of course. A man came in and walked slowly along the side on which the presidential box was, and I heard a man say, that's Booth. And I turned my head to look at him. He was still walking very slow and was near the box door when he stopped, took a card from his pocket, wrote something on it, and gave it to the usher who took it into the box. In a minute, the door was opened and he walked in. No sooner had the door closed than I heard the report of a pistol. And on the instant, Booth jumped out of the box onto the stage, holding in his hand a large knife 
and shouted so as to be heard over all the house, Sic Semper Tyrannus, and fled behind the scenes. I attempted to get to the box, but could not. And in an instant, the cry was raised, the president is assassinated. Though he was a surgeon, Todd did not treat the president. Instead, he was sent with details of the event to the telegraph office to send the news all over the country. That was not quite the end of the role that was played by the USS Montauk in the events of April 15th. When Booth was eventually found and killed at the Garrett Farm between Port Royal and Bowling Green in Virginia 12 days later, his body was brought back to Washington and to ensure security and separation from prying reporters or from angry and vengeful citizens, it was placed on board USS Montauk, still tied up to the wharf at the Navy Yard. Also placed on board was his still living companion, David Harold, who was incarcerated there. The officers and the crew on the Montauk remembered the presidential visit just days earlier, and they treated Harold with scorn and contempt. No one was quite sure what to do with Booth's body once it was on board. Commandant of the Navy Yard, John B. Montgomery, wrote to Gideon Wells to ask him about it. Rather delicately, I think, he noted that Booth's body was beginning to decompose inside the hot and humid turret of the Montauk. And deciding that some disposition of it must be made, Stanton and Wells ordered a quick autopsy. This time, Surgeon Todd did lend his professional services, as he and another doctor ascertained that Booth's death was caused by a gunshot wound in the neck, the ball entering just behind the sternocleidal muscle, two and a half inches above the clavicle passing through the bony ridge of the fourth and fifth cervical vertebrae, severing the spinal cord and passing out through the body. Like Lincoln, Booth had been shot in the head. After that determination, Booth's body was smuggled ashore and secretly buried under the floor of a room in the penitentiary. So in the end, the cost of the Civil War, the sacrifice, if you would, included the death of the president who gave the last full measure of devotion, and, of course, of his assassin. A few in the South who had sacrificed and suffered as well thought that was only just. But most saw it as the last ironic tragedy, as fate and John Wilkes Booth stole from them the one man who might have been able to engineer a national reconciliation. Perhaps they remembered the last few lines of his second inaugural that he had delivered only five weeks before and 150 years ago this Wednesday. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and for his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Thank you very much. Okay, I hope we have time for some questions tonight, and I hope there will be lots, because this is usually the most interesting part of the evening. Yes, sir. Had we, in uh, Food River, worked out an arrangement with the British and remained an empire like uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the other places that did remain, well, had we, in fact, lost the revolution? And the British Empire abolished slavery in 1833. Might we have avoided the war between the states? You know, I love what if questions because I can say anything. And how would you know, right? It's, it's an intriguing question, um, as intriguing as what if Lincoln had said, go, erring brothers, and be a separate country? How would the South have survived, if at all, on its own?
The problem with slavery is this, that within the British Empire, slavery was important, on, particularly in the Sugar Islands in the Lower Antilles and elsewhere um, in some of its distant outposts, but it had never had a root in Great Britain itself, and that, of course, is what the House of Commons paid attention to. What's the public opinion in Britain? So it was easy in 1833 for the British Empire to abolish slavery in its colonies because the people who wanted to cling to it desperately had no say in what the parliament did. That was, of course, the point of the revolution, no representation. Um, in the United States, that was not possible. Had we remained part of the empire, had Britain then attempted to impose upon this large and very lucrative part of its empire, the jewel in the crown, by then it would have been, um, it would have provoked the same kind of revolution, counter-revolution, if you would, that any attempt to restrict the expansion of slavery in the 19th century did in the American South. In other words, there would have been a war over slavery. And again, as I say, I can say anything because this is all speculative, but here's an opinion, and I'll share it with you. I mentioned the two wars that were absolutely essential in American history, the American Civil War and the Second World War. Essential because in those cases, there was no solution short of violence. I cannot imagine a circumstance in which the South says, Sure, let's create the circumstances where the wealth that we have accumulated over two and a half centuries is gradually winnowed away until it's worthless. Sure, let's do that. That's unimaginable to me. The, the structure, the philosophical and intellectual structure contrived by Southerners to explain why slavery was not so bad because we're bringing them Christianity and raising them up, etc., etc., etc. That was all created in order to make sure that those billions of dollars that they had invested in that labor system was still available to them. And had the British Empire attempted to impose upon the American colonies, were they still to be colonies in 1833, the reaction would have been the same. So I think the Civil War was inevitable, unavoidable, and necessary. And I'll say the same thing about the Second World War, because Hitler had to be defeated. There's no dealing with Adolf Hitler. And so those two wars, in my opinion, were tragically costly, entailed uh, uncountable sacrifice, and yet essential. I'm sorry for the sermon, but I mean, it's what you get if you ask a speculative question. Now, have I intimidated everybody else so there are no other questions? Or we... Yeah, yes, sir. We have the same problem in World War II between the Navy and the Army. I think the Pacific War was in the Pacific War. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, you know, I talk about this in the Civil War and people seem to assume, well, good thing we got that fixed right away, but of course we did not get that fixed. The, the fix, if that's the right word, came in 1947 with the National Security Act. The National Security Act of 1947 created the Department of the Navy, the Department of the Army, and unfortunately, the Department of the Air Force. <laughs> All of which were subsumed under a Department of Defense. Now you have usually called defense unification, semi-unification. Um, but all through World War II, we used the same system that we had in place in the Civil War. And that is to say that Army generals technically could not give orders to Navy lieutenants. Navy admirals could not order Army captains around. And yet, there was some recognition that if you've got three stars in your collar, you're probably going to be able to get your way with the O3s. Um, so, but it was a patched up situation, and as you mentioned in particular, the Nimitz and MacArthur confrontation, which really was more political than anything else. MacArthur had to get a job. MacArthur had to have a job. He was too senior, he was too famous, we'd invested too much in his role in the Philippines, which wasn't all that great, truth be known, but nevertheless, uh, having done that, you now had to give him a job. And so he got the Southwest Pacific, and Nimitz got the Central Pacific. And if you don't know the story, these two operated separately. Nimitz commanded the Marine Corps, the fleet, and the fleet air arm in the Pacific Ocean area. And MacArthur commanded the Army, the Army Air Force, and the Seventh Fleet within the Southwest Pacific. And they did their own thing. They almost never worked together, similar to the Civil War. 
Uh, it's a darn good thing we had overwhelming material and manpower superiority over the Japanese, or that could have been very messy. We figured it out, if we figured it out, in 1947. But that's the first time we finally had uh, unification of the services. Uh, and now the phrase that's very popular in the Pentagon, if you haven't heard it before, is purple suitor. You ever heard that one? A purple suitor is a guy when you take a, a, a baby blue Air Force uniform and a navy blue uniform and an olive drab green army uniform and you accidentally wash them in hot water all together and throw them in the dryer, they all come out purple. And it's being encouraged in the Pentagon because that, if you want to make the grade, if you want to climb that ladder and make flag rank, you better be a purple suitor because that's the, the catchphrase that indicates that you're a team player. You're not just an Army officer or a Navy officer or an Air Force officer. You're a United States military officer. Uh, but it took us a long time, and I think we're still working on it, to be honest. Yes? What if Lincoln had not made freeing the slaves an issue? Well, here's the thing about Lincoln. I mean, Lincoln is only in Poland. We only ever heard Lincoln's name. Because Lincoln is determined to devote his life to creating the political and economic environment in which slavery is doomed. That's his entire goal. Now, he becomes president and raises his hand to take that oath of office when 11, excuse me, seven states have already seceded and four more will follow them out of the union. So that's got to be job one, short term. But his goal always was to do something to get rid of slavery. Now, his something was a very different thing than emancipation. His something in 1860, 1859, his something was to say, I'm going to make it illegal for slavery to exist in the national territories. Here's the reason why. That's critical. Southerners knew this, too. This is not a secret. Everybody knows this. They can count. They can do the math. There's only so much land, arable land, in the 13 states, 15 states by 1860, that where slavery is legal. And that's not going to get any bigger. But the slave population grows exponentially. The number of slaves gets larger and larger and larger. Now, what happens when you have a lot of available labor and the amount of labor for them to do remains finite? The value of the labor declined. It's just like the stock market. The price of slaves was threatened unless slavery as an institution could expand. That was the issue. It was never the abolition of slavery. Lincoln never thought he'd live long enough to see that. He thought that would take 100 years, but he could do this. He could make it illegal for it to go anywhere into the West, and Southerners and Northerners alike believed, whether it was true or not, believed that if it didn't expand, it would die. It would cost you more to feed and house a slave than you could get out of him and work. And you couldn't sell him from Virginia down to Alabama because the price had dropped so low, nobody would buy one. It would undercut the entire market. Slavery had to expand. So Lincoln's non-expansion policy was what convinced the South to secede. They didn't think he'd interfere with slavery in Alabama or Mississippi. They thought, and they were right, that he would try to get it not to expand. But same thing. So Link, what happened to Lincoln as president was now that he's in the midst of a war to save the Union, war, that war in particular, but wars generally create their own momentum. Social change, social and economic change, take place faster in wartime than any time. You think about World War I. In 1939, British women couldn't go out after dark. It was just not done. And by 1945, they were rolling up their stockings and doing the jitterbug by themselves out in a pub. Social change accelerates during war. And this war, the acceleration of social change in this war, gave him an opportunity he didn't think he'd have. He justified it on the basis of saying, the South is using slaves as a military weapon. They're building fortifications, they're building forts, they're building arms. They are just like cannons. They're contraband. And given that, we can now claim them. And once claimed, they can't be reclaimed. So, yes, you're right in that the momentum of war created an opportunity for him to move faster than he thought. But that issue had to come up and already had come up in terms of the non-extension issue. And Lincoln would have stuck with that. He was once challenged 
In 1863, when uh, times looked very bad and his public opinion polls were weighed down, such as they were in those days, and it was urged upon him that he should back away from his promise of the Emancipation Proclamation, and he famously said, the promise having been given must be kept. And that promise, I think, would have come about even in the second term, assuming there is a full second term for Abraham Lincoln. So it's interesting to speculate about, and you're right, one influences the other, um, but slavery was going to be dealt with in Lincoln's administration one way or another, I am convinced. Is anybody on this side? Yes, sir. What are your thoughts on the idea of repatriating slaves to Africa? Yeah, the question's about repatriating the slaves. Um, this was a big issue. Lincoln thought about it long and hard, uh, very, very seriously. I don't think he was just playing with it. Uh, because his view was this. Freeing the slaves and leaving them in the South put them in a horrible position. The masters, the master class, if you would, in the South would clearly create circumstances that would be for them not a whole lot different from slavery, which is, of course, essentially what did happen. Many of them might try to migrate to the North, but you know what? Northerners are racist too. They don't like those blacks. They don't want those blacks coming up there and settling on their land and taking their jobs and getting in their way. They didn't want them around. And Lincoln thought the best thing for them would be to get them out of here. And he played with a lot of scenarios. He was going to create a colony in Nicaragua, right? He had this guy who bought up, I've forgotten how many, hundreds of thousands of acres in Nicaragua, and they were going to build a railroad across Nicaragua. Obviously, this is pre-canal. And the, the slaves could work on the railroad. They could mine the coal. They could do a, And they'd build houses for them down there. He worked on this. He got Congress to appropriate money for it. Another thought was somewhere in the Caribbean. There was, of course, already a Back to Africa movement that had begun in the 1840s and led to Liberia. But you know, it's just, if you do the math on this, it's impossible. If you took every ship, every ship in the Western world, I'm not, I don't know how many there were in China, I'm not counting those, but anything in the Atlantic, and used them for no other purpose than transporting American emancipated slaves from the Western Hemisphere to Africa, on a constant rotation, they would never overcome the natural increase of the population. You just can't do it. It's not possible. And once Lincoln came to that conclusion, he kind of backed away and said, well, let's just, this, that, we're going to have to figure out a way to live together. But he did think about it very hard. Anybody else? Yeah. How did the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation affect the, the rank and file of the U.S. Navy? I've heard about how it affected the Army, but how did it affect the Navy? Yeah, but the question concerned how did the uh, news that Lincoln had announced an Emancipation Proclamation affect those who were serving in the Navy? There's, of course, stories about how in the Army, and, and it's very divided. There were some who said, well, about time. We've got to get this damn war over with as fast as possible, and this might be the way to do it. And there were some who said, well, I'm not going to fight for this war if it's for the uh, you know, the N-word, uh, I'm only fighting for union. So it divided a lot. I think most on the side of let's end this war. Uh, and, uh, and I'll say Negro because I'm in a polite audience. A Negro can stop a bullet as well as anybody else. And if he stops one intended for me, that's just fine. In the Navy, um, there was more sense that that this was a good thing. There, there was very little of the opposition to it. There was a little, but not very much. And I think part of that was because of the legacy of the Navy. There had always been black sailors. You know, even when there were black soldiers, after they were allowed to serve in the Army, uh, they were segregated units. How do you segregate a ship? You know, you can't do that. They, somebody actually said, yeah, well, we'll have a ship with all blacks serving on that. No, that is not going to work, you know. Uh, well, we'll have blacks just in this part of the ship and not in that part of the ship. You can't do that. So Navy crews were integrated and had been integrated since 1775. So now the one segregationist aspect of this was it was difficult to, to get the, the really good jobs, engineering jobs in particular, were tough to come by, but there were blacks who did that too. Uh, disproportionately, they were in the lower end. You know, the rank structure in the Navy actually began with something called boy, 
Now that, of course, has all sorts of ramifications today, but that was actually a rank in the Navy. You had to be under a certain age, but a lot of blacks were, were listed as boys on the ship's roster, even if they were 32 years old. But then it was landsmen, meaning you had no experience at sea, but you were a grown-up. And then it was seamen, then able seamen, which means you could actually do stuff and on up the rank. Uh, and an awful lot of uh, black servicemen in the U.S. Navy were in those lower, lower end. But, but that ended up, that changed too. So um, I think generally, and I don't want to make it sound like the Navy was pure and the Army were a bunch of racists. There were problems in both services. But I think there were fewer problems in the Navy because of that legacy that they had of having blacks serving pretty consistently throughout the history of the Navy. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, knowing how quickly, relatively quickly, that the Union took control of New Orleans, why did it take so long to mount an effort um, into this area, Wilmington? Wilmington, Wilmington's a tough nut to crack. I, there's a guy in this audience who can tell you all about it. Uh, and most of what I know about it, I learned from him. So, uh, um, but New Orleans was the biggest city uh, in the South. The, the second or third, depending on whether you count Brooklyn and New York as two different cities, uh, port in the United States. And so the object of that became a goal very early on. And the reason it was possible, I'll toot the Navy's horn one more time, for the Navy essentially to take New Orleans almost without resistance is remember at the same time the Battle of Shiloh was heating up. This is April 62. Shiloh was fought 6-7 April 1862. And all of the troops from Louisiana were sucked up to the Battle of Shiloh because they assumed the forts downriver, Fort Jackson and Fort St. Philip, would be enough to hold the Navy out. But I talked earlier about how the Civil War marked a, a kind of pivot point in the technological revolution of warfare. And here's a case in point. Because the moment when forts would automatically defeat ships pretty much ended about five years before the Civil War began. Iron armor, steam propulsion, explosive shells, and rifled guns created circumstances that ships, as moving targets against uh, static land formations gained an edge that nobody until 1862 had kind of figured out yet. Uh, it was kind of true here at uh, Wilmington as well. But Wilmington has other problems for the Union. The Union had other problems at Wilmington beyond that. And as I say, Chris Fonda will tell you all about it. So I'm, I'm not going to step onto that turf. I'm, I'm too smart for that. Have we run out of steam? All right, last question. Yes, sir. Could you speak to uh, the Confederate foot soldier and how they felt about slavery? How the Confederate foot soldier felt about slavery. Um, I dealt with this a lot in my book on Pat Claiborne because, of course, Pat Claiborne, being an Irish immigrant and an advocate of emancipating slaves, arming them and putting them in the Confederate Army, learned in the process of making that proposal exactly how not only the foot soldier, but the officer corps in particular, felt about, uh, about slavery. I think that the vast majority of the Confederate foot soldiers felt that is just the way it is. It's been that way since I was born. I've never seen anything else. Slaves do slave work, and we do this other kind of work, and it's a symbiotic relationship that works for everybody. We provide organization and structure and ideas and intellect, and they provide what they are capable of providing. That view was so common as to be almost, if not entirely, universal on the food soldiers. So the idea of emancipating slaves, that was like saying, it's like emancipating cows. What do you, it makes no sense. What are you talking about? So they just conceived of this as a device by which Lincoln and the black Republicans, which was almost a single word, uh, were attempting to subdue uh, and dishonor the South, and that their real goal clearly had to be something else, because no sane, rational person would ever think that a black person could be, come on, free and a citizen of the United States. Are you out of your mind? There's got to be some other reason, and the only one I can understand is you want to come down here and subdue us and subject us to your tyranny. And I don't think that's just blowing smoke. It was so common to them and their environment and their culture and their upbringing that they just assume that must be what's going on. They could not imagine 
that Northerners, even these Boston ladies who went to church three times a day, could really honestly think that black people could be free. So there must be something else going on. I think that's a fairly representative, and there's always exceptions, but I think it's a fairly representative explanation of how most Southern foot soldiers felt about slavery. And that's an unfortunate place perhaps to end, but I'm going to stop because we're running out of hands and the evening's getting late. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.